I'm going to ask my friend Luke Willis Thompson to um, join me, and we're going to do a transition between our conversation by beginning to screen his film. Um, I don't know, that was really something. Should we just clap again? <laughs> um, uh, very, very honored to be joining Tina and, and following um, uh, that lecture, those notes, which I think we uh, will be able to slow down and, and keep trying to work through. Um, before we do that, I'm going to um, screen my um, my latest um, artwork, which was made for the Consola Basel um, last year, and then we'll kind of use this film to also further some of those some of those ideas. So um, this piece is called Underscore Human. So um, the way I want to start is by saying that the my entire sort of, I have to start by thanking um, Luke because the entire framework of adjacency comes from your work, um, from starting to write about autoportrait and um, thinking about what does it mean to um, make art that is not trying to speak for, but is trying to speak into the complexity of difference and different kinds of precarity. and. I wanted to ask you to share with me um, what does that mean to you? Um, because it really does come from trying to understand your work and it's given me an enormous amount um, to think about in a, norm in, a, in a really sort of generative framework to think in. Um. <laughs> this is really loud. <laughs> Okay, uh, if I hold it there, that's right. Um, well, uh, I guess adjacency's been an incredible, um, an incredible term that you, you gave me in this space of not knowing how to describe um, the relation that I would have to the subjects that um, my work might be exploring, or more particular, um, the families or, or people that might be performing within my films. And it's a, one of the reasons why that is itself a tricky negotiation is because of all the ways those types of relationships can go so wrong, have been done so wrong. And that, that story of wrongness um, is in a way, a it, it, it's its own history of photography. So adjacency became, for me, a way that um, uh, you were able to describe uh, my connection uh, in a couple of sentences, to put it, put, to put it bluntly. Those sentences may need a lot of unpacking, but um, for me, it is uh, the side of um, uh, exactly as you say, not claiming or attempting to uh, even allude to a familiarity of experience of another, um, but the mode of working through the space of difference. That difference, one of the reasons it's quite, quite important is because that difference is also the side of, I think, a broken relationality that we all already have in the world. So, in a way, we're connected whether we like it or not. Um, and there needs to be some kind of attempt to, uh, I think as Tavi has said before, um, rupture the broken connectedness. 
the adjacency in this film, if I, if I could just run that through, is quite complicated. Um, I think you should tell them more about that. <laughs> um, this piece, uh, underscore human, is the documentation of uh, a minute sculpture that measures two centimeters cubed, um, which is comprised of, of um, skin, sellotape, and dressmaker's pins, and was made by the, um, the British artist Donald Rodney, who passed away uh, 21 years ago, um, almost to this day, actually. And, um, of sickle cell anemia. Of sickle cell anemia, and the complications that arise from living with that condition. So he was an artist who, um, who had to work through specifically a black pain. Mm -hmm. But that pain is in, inseparable from what he decided to do with his work. And what was fascinating, so fascinating for me about his work was that he used his own, the own pain he was going through in his words, to look at the diseases in society that could be cured. Um, uh, uh, Donald um, made a lot of self-portraits as police victims, um, kind of overlaying his own portrait into the faces of people like Colin Roach and Joy Gardner. And um, that kind of state violence and anti-black violence, that was the, the target of a, of a number of very precise exhibitions and installations. This piece is something made uh, while he was in hospital, um, three months before he passed away. Um, he was still working on an exhibition in the South London Gallery, and uh, he had prepared this piece. It was a kind of, I think, a uh, long time coming sculpture. Uh, he had collected the skin that he used to kind of fashion the work for a long time, uh, as his widow had described to me, as a kind of party tra trick. He would, he would pull it out of his pocket um, and have people unfold it where they were kind of knocked over with what it was. Uh, but, but kind of to, in that tradition of the, of the great works made in hospital boards, uh, be it, you know, Matisse's snail among them, uh, he comes up with this brilliant act of fashioning a piece of origami and then holding it together. This, this piece um, is incredibly fragile and incredibly precious and um, can't, can't be uh, exhibited. So what I did um, in the course of making this work was to um, uh, work with his estate to figure out how a way to, to show it uh, into the future would go. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that I was thinking about is that, and we've talked about the the continuity in the last, you know, their last three pieces, I'd say, of the sister image, um, and creating a sister image that can do a certain kind of work of adjacency, which is not to um, present the violence or the precarity of the subject, right? Not to actually give us full access to that, but to demand of us that we do a certain level of work in the encounter with it. Um, and I think that one of the most profound ways that you do that is through silence. That there is this kind of um, inscrutability <laughs> that you um, are able to conjure um, in placing the audience in an extended moment of silence. Um, of having then, you know, one of the things that I do in silent rooms, particularly in silent art rooms, is I listen to what people are actually, the sounds they're actually saying. 
that's, that they're making. And so one of the things that I was noticing in this room were fidgets, um, movements, that people, being in silence is one of the most excruciating experiences for humans. And that's when I know there's certain work that's happening, right? Even if it's the pushing away of the work, <laughs> right? And so, so I'm wondering um, about that in your work, about the sort of demands of silence that your work makes on people and how that, I mean, we've talked about the term effective labor for me, which is um, a term that I think that gets sort of short shrift. Um, but when we're talking about art and the certain kinds of effective labor that go into it, I just wanted to hear you talk out loud about that as well. Um, well, I, th I mean, I, for me, um, um, like silence began for me around making films um, really as a, as a kind of like productive metaphor. Um, um, on one hand, like all the filmmaking I did or have done um, has been at this kind of amateurish level, right? I, you know, it's very hard to make film and uh, it's hard to make sound work. So the easiest thing is, is to not. <laughs> and I would be kind of like, I would be kind of like lying to say like there wasn't an attempt just to kind of like, like I needed the image so bad that I couldn't wait for the point where I learned how to use music. <laughs> but the productive metaphor that came from, from doing that, and this is when I think silence becomes really intentional, and I was, I was interested in the possible connection between the anti-gravitational was that um, um, I came up with just for myself this this saying of when when my first film Cemetery was was playing um, that it made sense to me that it was silent because in a world where we can't breathe, uh, of course there can be no sound. So that side of of breathlessness and uh, oppression or living under oppressive systems where it, where it feels like there is no ear around the image also means a kind of muteness and a sort of strange physics. So, you know, I think when we're dealing with Khalil Joseph and we're also dealing um, not only with bodies that uh, uh, can float and fly and move in space, but we're dealing with environments that um, presented us to filmmakers without the same kind of like laws of motion. You can't, you can't stop there. You have to say that. You have to say more about that. Um, laws of motion. Say more about what, what that means. Just paint the picture for me. <laughs> You're making this really tough. <laughs> it's my job. <laughs> um... Well, I will answer that, but to buy myself some time, can I ask you? Yes. <laughs> um, you mentioned the, the, the gravity of anti-blackness, mm -hmm. the gravity of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. I also know from your other work and from other artists you've worked with that there's an interest in the gravity of the lens and what it um, sucks towards it and the ways that that can be both a form of capture and a side of escape. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to know how those two things work together for you. This is gonna be a tit for tat. So I ask a hard question and he dodges it and then he asks me a hard question and I'm gonna try and answer it. Um, well, um, so one of the things I'm really interested in, that's, that's one of the things that gravity is trying to do for me is I'm just interested in the ways in which black bodies move, the way they respond to forces, the way in which um, they come back 
you know, everything from, they come back and they resuscitate and they bounce and they fall, but they fall backwards and forwards. And I'm really interested in the way in which black artists are um, expanding that. Um, and so I started thinking about gravity when I was looking at um, Arthur Jaffa's work and looking at the ways in which black bodies move there. Um, and, and there's a, a way that, um, he, what was so striking to me is that he has a way of using different um, layers of images, right? So he, he is an archivist, you know? <laughs> He's one of the most profoundly um, generative archivists that I know working today. And so what he's able to do in the different ways in which he both makes images but also remakes images is he shows us what we are not seeing in those original images, right? And so to me, that's putting, that's reframing frames. I mean, reframing individual frames and making us see them differently by virtue of what they're seen in relationship to. And so that, in that way, it is about sort of the limits of the frame. And it's about the ways in which the frame rate can be exploited to get us to see differently. Um, and so what the, the other part about that is on the one hand, so what is it framing such that we see something differently? But the other is this notion of a black gaze that I'm trying to, to develop, which is to say, what if we are not, what if a black gaze is not about the depiction of black folk, right? So what if it's not about the depiction of black people, more black people, more black stories, if it's not about the multiplication of it, but it's about your relationship to blackness or its absence. And so what kind of work is challenging us to interrogate who we are, not, oh, learning more about black people. And that that to me is a really important um, and significant step that I am seeing right now in the world of contemporary art um, because it's not just about more folk with cameras, it's about um, being able to shift our understanding of blackness when it is and is not there. Um, and that I, fi that I find that um, this marvelous potential to create something new um, and to create new practices of visualization. <laughs> you're, getting, you're getting uppity back there. <laughs> um, I want to ask um, Tavia what, how we're doing on time. No, no, it's not. Uh, we can go for another uh, three, four minutes, I guess. Three, four minutes? Yeah. Oh, should we open it and up we'll to take... questions? Or... Yeah, maybe this is a time to open Unless it Unless you up. had another question. I didn't want to cut you off. Um, no, not at... No, I don't. Okay. I mean, I, so, I sort of do, but I hope they'll come out okay. as, as we keep going, yeah. I just feel like they've been really quiet for a really long time, and now we have to let them speak. Let our people speak. <laughs> There's a question back there. I see. Okay, I see a question in the back. Hi. Could you please explain the word adjacency? No, I can't. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because you used it a lot, and I don't really know what it means. Okay. So that might be a sign that I was not successful in my presentation, but um, I will try and break it down for you. Adjacency, um, when you're talking about the, the root word adjacent, that would be being next to, right? Um, adjacency in the way in which I'm trying to talk about it is about seeing oneself in relation to, okay? So seeing oneself in relation to and at the same time, what I just said, having that relationship to, that next to-ness, have consequences, right? Has an impact on who you are. So it's not just two things side by side, but there's a relationship of difference and potentially a, a relationship of transformation and power that needs to be addressed in that next to-ness. So there's an accountability 
about being next to, about being beside, that I think we need to actually act upon. Is that okay? Okay. I think we have maybe time for... Two questions. Two questions? <laughs> Or not. <laughs> or none. There's also an opportunity at the end. I know we're at that moment in the afternoon, afternoon where uh, we probably should actually thank you both for <laughs> the generosity of this engagement. And um, please, I would just invite the audience to give a round of applause to Gina Kemp and to Luke Thompson.